So, okay. Uh, thank you for all our speakers, panelists, and I would like uh, to thank also Dr. Zainab, uh, who is with us sharing this session. Uh, as you know, all know that uh, Dr. Zaina is the president of the Lebanese uh, Pulmonary Society. So we have the pleasure on behalf of AMAC and CRG boards to invite you to attend the ABC Oncology Educational Course Lung Cancer Module Session 1, which will be talk about the update on management of locally advanced and small cell uh, lung cancer. Uh, just for a few minutes, uh, we will let the floor to the president of the CRG, Dr. Fadi Farahat, uh, to give us uh, some uh, notes about this ABC educational courses. Please, Dr. Fadi, the floor is yours, and then Dr. Zena will present the speakers. Okay, uh, yes, yes. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sami, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, indeed, I would like just to uh, see if I, I would like to give you a briefing about the ABC educational course. Uh, so uh, it's a course. Uh, I, I am Fadi, I am Fadi Farad, the medical doctor. Uh, and I am the president of Cancer Research Group as Dr. Samuel Khatib, the president of AMAC. And uh, our oncology education course consists of multiple classes, like ATY and GE and others, also associated with some special. So we have the breast, they have the lung module, we have the GYN, and we have others, for example. Uh, we have the uh, the special modules like chemotherapy in COVID area, biosimilar that are upcoming. So uh, till now we did in 9 June and in 16 June the breast modules. Then after the 19 June the GI mo uh, session, one session of the module and one session of hemato, one session of precision medicine. And soon today we are running 30 June the lung module. We have after. The next week, the GU module, the first session, the second session of hemato, and two special, two special sessions on biosimilars and CT. And in August, uh, we will be, ABC will be having uh, holidays. So we'll see you in September to continue our program. So please note that every module is consistent uh, of many uh, sessions that will be presented. And as you, as you can see in the orange color, it's the session that uh, are awaited to be done. Thank you very much, and I leave the, f the floor to Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The floor is yours, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for inviting me to be with you in this very interesting educational meeting. And uh, I want to uh, wish a good evening and very interesting session for everyone in this uh, session. I see many of our colleagues as panelists and I will be honored to present uh, some of them. I will start with uh, Dr. Danny Gaspar, who is uh, a pulmonologist and uh, critical care medicine specialist, and he, he works in Mount Lebanon Hospital, Lebanon. He will uh, talk about what is the optimal diagnostic workup for stage three uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma. Dr. Gaspar, uh, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ron, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so, I'm a, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Ron said, I'm a pulmonologist. I practice in Lebanon. I uh, specialize in interventional pulmonology. Uh, and I will be talking to you today about staging of locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so, th this is the outline of my talk. I will, uh, first we will talk just briefly about what constitutes stage 3 lung disease. Then mainly I will be talking about the diagnostic methods that we will use, like CT scan, uh, PET scan and MRI, and comparison of invasive techniques. 
and for that, I will uh, discuss the uh, the what the guidelines say about all of these. Uh, now, there's many guidelines that address this, but the, the guidelines that go mostly in detail about these are the American College of Chest Physician ACCP guidelines from 2013. And I will mention the most recent guidelines, which is the ESMO, European Society of Medical Oncology, from 2017. Now, the major goals of every evaluation for lung cancer is to figure out what the clinical extent and stage of the disease is, where you get your first biopsy, how you stage the disease, you get the specific histologic type, and then you decide what therapy you're gonna go for, uh, surgery or chemotherapy, immunotherapy or whatever, and then you have to factor in the patient preferences in there. And when you talk about lung cancer, you're basically talking about the TNM staging, uh, and the eighth edition is the most recent one that came out, I believe, in 20, 2016. Uh, now, what I wanted to show you in this table is mainly the importance of the N2 and N3 uh, lymph nodes. So if you, if you have a, a, a small nodule, a T1 nodule, if you have an N0, you're a stage 1A. If you have an N2 lymph node that's positive for malignancy, you're at stage 3A, and the treatments obviously are completely different. So this is why it is very important to try to figure out if these lymph nodes are involved with malignancy because they change your management completely. And if we look at the map of the lymph nodes, um, then uh, you can see that uh, the lymph nodes go from 1 to 14, basically. Everything that is single digit is mediastinal. Everything that is double digit is hyler. So for example, if you have a right lung mass, these lymph nodes here, 10, 11 to 14, are all hyalur lymph node, ipsilateral hyalur lymph node, and these would constitute uh, N1 lymph nodes. Everything that's 1, 2, 4, 7, 8, and 9, these are mediastinal lymph nodes, and these are N2. And everything with an L on the left side, or left hilum also, are N3 lymph nodes. So when you do your first imaging for evaluation of lung cancer, what you're going to see is three clinical pictures. Um, the, uh, the first picture you might see is a small nodule with no involvement in lymph node, what we call low-risk N2 and 3 lymph node or radiologic stage 1. You might see patient with metastatic disease or stage 4. But a lot of times you're going to see something intermediate. So a, a, a lung mass with possibly a lymph node that's enlarged or PET positive or something like that. And um, this is where your evaluation will go in and your different tests will go in. To con consider something radiologic stage one, and pretty much all your, of your guidelines agree on this, to, to consider something radiologic stage one, that means you have a peripheral tumor. So it has to be peripheral, not central. It has to be smaller, so less than three centimeters, and you have to have normal lymph node on CT scan and no uptake on PET scan. So if you have all of these conditions, then you can consider your, um, your uh, lung mass or lung cancer, what have you, as a stage one lung cancer, and then you can proceed to just, you don't have to do staging of the mediastinum, and you can proceed to resect the, that mass, do, do a frozen section. If it's cancer, you complete lobectomy and lymph node dissection. If you have stage four, it's pretty straightforward. You just get a biopsy from wherever you can get the biopsy, the easiest place, just to get the adequate histologic type and phenotype, and then you proceed to treatment. But what happens when you have radiologic stage two or three disease, meaning you have enlarged lymph nodes or PET positive lymph nodes or central tumors? If you have central tumors, even if the lymph nodes look normal, there is an intermediate to high risk of involvement of N2, N3, and you need to do some more evaluation. So then you're going to look at your diagnostic modalities. The first modality, the one that we do for every patient pretty much, is a CT scan. We do it with IV contrast if we can. But the major limitation of the CT scan is its low accuracy. And so the, the ACCP guidelines from 2013 did a systematic review of 7,300 patients. And what they found is that the, the sensitivity of the CT scan is 50% pretty much. And the positive predictive value is very low. And even the negative predictive value, you're still missing about 20%. Meaning if you see something on a CT, on a CT scan that's abnormal, you have a 50-50 chance of it being cancer and 50-50 chance of it not being cancer. Meaning this is not a good tool for staging. 
and we have to have find something else. So how about PET scan? So PET scan or a combined PET CT scan is obviously more accurate. Sometimes things look normal on a CT scan and then they light up on a PET scan. That's about 20% of cases. And so you can make the diagnosis of a stage three or stage four, and it can decrease the number of futile thoracotomies. So we all know this. The problem is PET scans have no consensus. There is no consensus of the value of PET scan as a staging tool. And when people have looked at this, they found that the use of PET scan as a staging tool did not improve mortality. Also, there is no strictly defined criteria as to what constitutes a positive PET scan. So a positive result, what is the SUV? What is the cutoff? Now, frequently we're gonna use an SUV of two or 2.5. We're gonna look at the mediastinal structures, the mediastinal blood pool, but there is really no strict criteria of what constitutes a positive PET scan. So what do the guidelines recommend? So the guidelines rec do recommend using the PET scan, even though there are some limitations to the PET scan, there is a great 1B recommendation to use PET scan in these patients. So I, I think most of our patients will get a PET scan. But then you move on to the million dollar question is can we use the PET scan as the sole study for staging of these patients? And the, the answer lies in the, um, you know, the, the, the configuration of the test. So what the test gives you. The issue, I think the main issue of the PET scan is it's not specific for cancer and it's, you know, the sensitivity is about 80% and the specificity is 88%. But if something lights up on the PET scan, that doesn't mean that it's malignant. And if something doesn't light up, that doesn't rule out malignancy. The, your positive predictive value, so if something lights up, 75% uh, of it is cancer, but then 25% is not. And then you're also gonna miss 10% of, you know, your negative predictive value, you're still gonna miss 10% of patients where nothing lights up on the PET, but they actually have involvement of lymph nodes or something else. So the risk that you run with PET scan is if something lights up and you consider it cancer and you don't prove it, you can upstage those patients and you can deny them a potentially curable surgical resection. So this is why confirmation of PET scan, of suspicious findings on a PET scan is crucial, is super important. And this is exactly what the guidelines recommend. If you have lymph node enlargement, or if you have abnormal PET activity on these lymph nodes, the guidelines recommend doing an invasive staging of the mediastinum, and that is a great 1C recommendation in both cases. Now, very briefly about brain MRI, I just wanted to mention brain MRI because different, um, uh, different guidelines have different recommendations for brain MRI. For example, the N NCCN recommends it for all patients except stage 1A. The BTS and the NICE guidelines for all patients considered for curative therapy. The ACCP guidelines for stage 3 and 4 and any symptomatic patients. I think a lot of these patients will get an MRI, but I just you know, wanted to mention this in there. And now moving on to the last part of my talk, and that is discussing the different techniques of invasive staging of the mediastinum. Um, so in the invasive staging of the mediastinum, there are uh, like three basic uh, methods. One is EBUS, plus or minus EUS. When you read about EUS, that's basically doing EBUS, but also putting the bronchoscope in the esophagus to stage, uh, to get station, lymph node stations eight and nine. So EBUS or EBUS EUS, mediastinoscopy and VATS thoracotomy. Now, obviously VATS thoracotomy is the most uh, aggressive one and uh, we're gonna use that very, very rarely if everything else fails. So I'm not gonna talk about this too much. That's very rare to use it. I'm just gonna compare EBUS and mediastinoscopy because these are the ones that we use most commonly in our daily practice. So EBUS, what is EBUS? EBUS stands for endobronchial ultrasound, and that's basically a bronchoscope with an ultrasound at the tip of it. And that allows you to see inside the airway, not just inside the airway, but what's something what's outside the airway. This is a typical view of EBUS. You put your bronchoscope in and you touch the airway, and you're gonna see this. This is, sorry, this is an abnormally big lymph node, and it has this typical salt and pepper appearance. And then you put your needle in and your needle can go up to five centimeters in there. And you're gonna see in lifetime, your needle move in and out of that lymph node and get cells and to be able to send them for testing. 
Now, as you see, most of these lymph nodes are very close to the airways, and I can get all of these lymph nodes, including eight and nine through the esophagus. The only lymph node stations that I cannot get are five and six because you have the aorta and the pulmonary artery in between the, my airway and these lymph nodes. Now, EBUS is a very good test, very performant test. It has a sensitivity of about 90% with a negative predictive value of 91%. And if you combine it with the US in the studies, its sensitivity went up to 91 and the negative predictive value to 96. So obviously a test that performs very well. For all these tests, getting a true positive predictive value is very hard to get because if you think about it, if you get a positive biopsy, you're, gonna, you're not gonna move to surgery and confirm the positive biopsy, you're just gonna consider that positive and move on to the next step of your treatment. The most important aspect is your negative predictive value, I think, because when you do a procedure and you get a negative result, how confident are you of that negative result? Because that will uh, f you know, tell you what the next steps of your treatment is and that will help you with staging of your cancer. How about mediastinoscopy? What is mediastinoscopy? That's a surgical procedure where the surgeon does an incision right here above the sternum. It's a surgical incision done under general anesthesia in the operating room. And they put, you know, we used to have these rigid mediastinoscopes. Now we have video mediastinoscopes with video at the tip of them. And they go in next to the trachea and they look at all these mediastinal uh, areas and, and they can, you know, get bigger chunks and biopsies from them. Now you cannot, easily get to the high level areas with mediastinoscopy, with mediastinoscopy, but you can get to the mediastinal lymph nodes. Now, traditional mediastinoscopy had a sensitivity of 78% in these reviews and 89% if you use video and a negative predictive value of 91%. Now, the things to consider when thinking about one versus the other, uh, in EBUS, EBUS is a bronchoscopic technique it requires minimal, minimal anesthesia. It, we, we've even done it with just conscious sedation. And it's a same day procedure. Obviously your patient's gonna have the procedure and then leave after a couple of hours of, of uh, recovery. The con is it's a needle technique that does not get you core biopsies. It gets you cells, not core biopsies. It has been proven without a doubt that it is very performant in lung cancer where you can get the diagnosis, you can get markers, PDL1, EGFR, ALK, and everything. But maybe if you're thinking lymphoma, maybe you need bigger chunks and maybe mediastinoscopy in that specific subtype might be more performant. But in general, EBUS does really, really well in lung cancer. Mediastinoscopy has always been considered the histolic, histo historic gold standard and it can give you larger fragments. However, as we said, it cannot get to the higher lymph nodes you need more anesthesia requirements. Usually it's general anesthesia and they usually require 24 hour admission uh, to the hospital. Now there's this one study I wanted to mention. It's a multi-standard trial of 250 patients where they either tried either EBUS EUS or surgical staging. If you do just surgical staging, your sensitivity is 79%. As I said, probably because that you can't get to higher areas. And if you're not thorough enough Doing imagestinoscopy, you may miss some lymph nodes. If you just do EBUS EUS, you can get an 85% sensitivity in that study. But when they did EBUS EUS and then followed by surgical staging, when the biopsies were negative and there was a high suspicion, their sensitivity jumped up to 94%. So what do the guidelines say about this? So all the guidelines also agree on this. EBUS and or EUS, EBUS plus EUS should be the first best test, the number one test, and that is a grade one B recommendation. And in the ESMO guidelines, this is actually now, you know, by 2017, they had, this had become a grade one A recommendation. So they recommend biopsies, the first biopsy to be done by EBUS plus EUS. But they say if the EBUS EUS does not reveal nodal involvement in high clinical suspicion, then mediastinoscopy is indicated. And I will end with this. This is from the ESMO guidelines. This just summarizes it very well. If you have negative lymph nodes, as we said, and a small peripheral tumor with no lymph node involvement, you can proceed to surgery. In every other situation, you need to do EBUS uh, to confirm. 
If you have low suspicion, then you're good. If you have a high suspicion, you confirm your negative, your, if you have a negative result with EBOS EUS, you confirm it with mediastinoscopy, and then you move on to therapy. And I will end here and thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank you, Dr. Gaspar. We go directly to the second presentation on advanced radiating techniques for locally advanced non-small cell lung carcinoma by Dr. Basim Youssef. Dr. Basim Youssef is Assistant Professor of Clinical Radiation Oncology, Department of Radiation Oncology at American University of Beirut, Lebanon. The floor is, uh, is yours, Dr. Basim Youssef. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Farhat, for inviting me to speak tonight. So it's a pleasure to discuss with you this evening the role of radiation therapy as a current standard of care for locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer, in addition to a review of the advanced radiotherapy techniques. Now, well, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, so, uh, very briefly, I'm going to start with an introduction and then I'm going to uh, go Dr. through... Yusuf, excuse me, are you sharing your screen? Yes, you can because, see it? No, we can't see it yet. Okay, let me try again. Okay, now it's working. Now? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so once again, I'm going to discuss with you the role of radiation therapy as a standard of care for stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer in terms of radiotherapy dose, radiotherapy technique, and the use of concurrent chemotherapy. And later, I will be going through the advances in radiation techniques uh, over the recent years. So we know that non-small cell lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer death worldwide. And it, uh, it is about 85 to 90% of all lung cancers. At diagnosis, about a third of patients have a stage three disease for which the standard of care is concurrent chemoradiation. This is the most recent NCCN guidelines, version five, 2020. And we can see that patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, their current standard of care is concurrent chemoradiotherapy followed by immunotherapy using durvalumab. On this slide, I'm showing you the evolution of the standard of care for locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer. In the past, radiotherapy alone was used with dismal oncologic outcomes. Later on with the introduction of chemotherapy, where it was used sequentially, the median survival has improved to about 13 to 14 months. And most recently, as we were saying, the standard of care is the use of radiotherapy and chemotherapy concurrently. The most recent studies have showed significant improvement of the median survival to about 28 to 30 months. And this is even without the use of adjunctive immunotherapy. This is the RTOG 9410. It's a landmark randomized phase three studies that compared the previous standard of care, which is sequential chemotherapy using vimblastin and cisplatin, followed by sequential radiotherapy to a total dose of 63 gray, to concurrent chemoradiotherapy using the same platinum doublet with concurrent radiotherapy to the same dose. And the third arm used a different uh, radiotherapy approach which is twice daily radiotherapy to a total dose of 69.6 gray. So here are, here are the results of the study. We can see that the median survival was significantly better with the use of concurrent chemo radiotherapy, 17 months versus 14.6 months in the sequential arm with a significant p-value of 0.04. Now, this study, we were hoping to improve the oncologic outcomes by increasing the radiotherapy dose, the RTOG0617. And this study 
544 patients were randomized to 60 gray radiotherapy concurrent with carboplatin and paclitaxel, ARM1, and ARM2, the same chemotherapy was used with a dose escalated radiotherapy to 74 gray. And there was a second randomization for the use of concurrent cetuximab. Unfortunately, the results were disappointing for the addition of or increasing the dose of radiotherapy led to worse oncologic outcomes with a median survival of 20 months versus around 29 months for the standard of care. So uh, we still use the standard of care, which is 60 gray and 30 fractions for our patients with stage three and small cell lung cancer. Now, what is the best platinum doublet to use in this patient population? Multiple regimens are used, including cisplatin, etoposide, carboplatin, paclitaxel, and even cisplatin navelbine that is more used in Europe. On this slide, I'm showing you a randomized study published in 2017 in the Annals of Oncology that tried to compare these two most commonly used regimens. So cisplatin etoposide, two, total of two cycles with concurrent radiotherapy versus weekly carboplatin paclitaxel with the same dose of radiotherapy. And in this study, we show a significant improvement in the three-year overall survival favoring the use of cisplatin etoposide with a significant p-value of 0.024 Despite this encouraging overall survival benefit, still we have this ongoing controversy, even in the United States, where many institutions use either of these two common regimens. And this is because these results have not been reproduced so far. And another reason is that in the arm using carboplatin and paclitaxel, additional two cycles of chemotherapy were not given in this study. Now, in terms of difference in toxicity between the two regimens, we can see that the grade three esophagitis was more common when we use cisplatin otoposide, 20%, versus only 6% with carboplatin and paclitaxel. On the other hand, the risk of radiation pneumonitis was quite higher in the carboplatin and paclitaxel, which is 33%, versus only 18.9% in the cisplatin otoposide. And to note that about 5% of the acute Treatment-related deaths were due to radiation pneumonitis. Now, I'm going to move on to the evolution of radiotherapy techniques for non-small cell lung cancer. On the, left side, on the left side of the slide, I'm showing you the historic 2D radiation therapy planning. So in the old days, we used to use only two beams of radiotherapy, one anterior and one posterior. And you can see that all this area is being treated to a high dose radiation, which entails very high risk of toxicity. Whereas on the right side of this slide, I am showing you the current standard of care, which is 3D conformal radiotherapy. And in this technique, we do a CT scan for every patient where the tumor is contoured. And to this uh, gross tumor volume, we add a safety margin that we call a CTV and then a PTV. And this is where we use multiple beams of radiotherapy, three, four, or even five, that all converge to the area of involved uh, tumor and lymph nodes, which causes less radiation to go to normal tissues, including the lungs, the heart, and the spinal cord, which has led to a less, less risk of toxicity. Now, the use of PET-CT has been quite important, uh, especially in radiotherapy planning, for we all know and we all see uh, small lymph nodes on CT scan that are less than one centimeter. And PET CT scan helps us because it has a higher sensitivity in detecting subcentimetric involved lymph nodes. And another uh, use of PET CT scan is that can, it can differentiate the tumor from lung atelectasis, as I'm gonna show you in the following slide. So here we have an example of a CT scan where we see all this area that is very difficult to differentiate a tumor between collapsed lung. And in the lower slide, you can see the tumor that is quite avid on PET scan. And more laterally, we have the collapsed lung. And in addition to that, we can see a small lymph node that is seen on the CT scan that 
lit up on the PET scan and eventually on eBus, it was found to be involved by cancer. Another uh, technique that we nowadays use for radiotherapy planning is the use of 4D computed tomography. Now there is a fact in all lung tumors is that they move. So during respiration, during ventilation, these tumors tend to move up and down or even in a circular pattern, which makes it difficult for us to really treat them throughout the radiotherapy session. So on the following slide, I can show you how a 4D CT scan can help us uh, manage this problem. So on the left side, we can see a normal CT scan that shows the tumor in a single uh, location during the breathing cycle. And on the right side, we can see the 4D CT that allow us to superimpose all the location of the tumor during the breathing cycle, which is quite bigger than the static picture on the left side. And in one study published in 2012, the motion of such tumor are estimated to be around 10 millimeter plus or minus seven, depending on the location in the chest. So we know that tumors that are close to the diaphragm tend to move the most. Now, image-guided radiation therapy is also a great innovation because it allows us to check that the patient is in a current position every single day when he comes for his radiation uh, treatment. So as I show you on this current slide, whenever the patient comes for his treatment, a daily CT scan is taken before his radiotherapy session, which allows uh, which allow us to really make sure that his position is accurate on the treatment table. Finally, I will move to uh, the novel radiotherapy technique, which is IMRT or intensity modulated radiation therapy. It's a promising technique that provides dosimetric and clinical advantages for patients with non-small cell lung cancer because it allows a better sparing of the normal structures from the high dose radiation, specifically the heart, the lungs, and the esophagus, and multiple studies were done comparing 3D versus IMRT, mainly from MD Anderson Cancer Center, that showed that toxicity is less, specifically in terms of esophagitis and radiation pneumonitis. And one of these studies also showed a possible survival advantage for IMRT to still be proven in randomized phase three studies. Now, the, because IMRT is an expensive technique, which costs about the double for what 3D conformal radiotherapy costs, we really have to be careful in selecting the patients who would benefit most from this technique. And we usually use it for patients who have a tumor that is very close to the spinal cord or the heart, or in cases where the tumor is very large. On this slide, I illustrate how a tumor that is very close to the spinal cord the use of IMRT can help us push the high dose radiation and curve it away from the spinal cord that is illustrated in this slide. And this is the conclusion. This is my conclusion. The prognosis of patients with stage three non-small cell lung cancer have significantly improved. And nowadays we have a median overall survival of 28 to 30 months with the use of contemporary chemo radiation. And these numbers will very likely be better with the addition of Durvalumab, as we're gonna see in the coming uh, presentations. Radiation techniques have dramatically improved over the past two decades, as I just showed you. And finally, these strategies will permit treatment escalation and lead to higher disease control rates with a better toxicity profile. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dani and Dr. Basim, uh, for the excellent presentations. And it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists, uh, Dr. Sharara Saifi. Dr. Sharara, uh, she is a faculty member of Shaheed Bench University of Medical Science in Iran, and she represents the Iranian Society of Medical Oncology and Hematology. And our uh, second uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Sam Hashim, 
Dr. Sameh Hashem, he is the consultant radiation oncology at Khaldi Medical Center Plaza, and he's one of the best radiation oncologists that we have here really in Jordan. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours for both of you, and we have 10 minutes uh, to discuss all uh, the issues of the two lectures and any comments that you have. Okay, so um, I think we have 10 minutes for the Q&A. So far, no questions from the audience. Um, I have a, a, a question, uh, Dr. Bassam, regarding the uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy for limited uh, small disease uh, with, uh, uh, with small lymph nodes uh, in the mediastinum. I note that central lesions are, uh, yeah, have carry a lot of bad prognosis uh, regarding toxicity of radiation. But uh, do you think, is there room to use stereotactic body radiotherapy in the, uh, uh, in the locally advanced lung cancer? So your question is the use of SBRT for yeah. node positive non-small cell lung cancer? This is yeah, with limited small, less than one centimeter disease. Yeah, uh, next to the mediastinum. I'm not sure if that's possible. I just want to see if there's any, any future studies that really suggests uh, the use of, SP, of SPRT, especially in the era of hyperfractionation and the COVID-19. I'm not sure if that's possible to just make the treatment period less than 30, 30, 30 fractions. Yeah, so I'm going to try to answer this question. But first of all, I'm going to try to make a difference between two scenarios. The first one is the use of stereotactic body radiotherapy for small tumors that are close to the mediastinum or to the hilum, or what we call ultra-central tumors. Yeah. And I'm going to start with this scenario. So when the first studies of SBRT came out, they used a very high dose per fraction. And the typical example is the use of 60 gray and three fractions, as was used maybe 10 or 20 decades ago. And the use of this very high dose SBRT led to significant toxicity in ultracentral central tumor. And some of those toxicity, toxicities were fatal. Like some patients had uh, hemorrhage, some patients had uh, airway uh, collapse. So this is why in the beginning, it was found to be very toxic to use SBRT for central lesions. Until researchers from the Netherlands and other institutions try to give SBRT by using more protracted treatment. So instead of giving only limited number of fractions, which is one to three, they used around eight fractions. And the typical dose that I quote is 60 gray given in eight fractions. And they published their single institution series around two, two years ago. And by using this fractionation, they were able to show an excellent local control that is close to 80 to 90%. And the excess toxicity that was used in the initial studies was not seen in their publications. And this is what I actually use for these patients who are not amenable for surgery and who have early stage ultracentral tumors. Now, your, your sec the second part of the question was, if we have node positive non-small cell lung cancer, like specifically N2 disease or positive mediastinal lymph nodes. 3A. So now, there's, there are no studies that really show that we can do this safely, and I have never used it in clinics so far. So for all my patients with positive mediastinal lymph nodes, I'm still using the conventional radiotherapy whether 60 gray in 30 fractions or 45 gray in 15 fractions, and I'm not using really the very high dose per fraction. So SBRT, I haven't been using it for a note positive non small cell lung cancer. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Sharara, do you have any, any uh, input that you want to add or questions to ask? Yes, I have a question um, from Dr. Gaspard. Um, my question is, how uh, do you select the patient for mediastinal staging um, for EBOS or EUS or mediastinal therapy? Uh, is it um, your, uh, do you uh, do the, uh, this EBOS and uh, EUS in the same time or no? Uh, it's based on, um, 
head CT scan update in a mediastinal node? Um, thank you for this question. So usually what we do is, um, if anything is abnormal on CT scan or on PET scan, obviously we're gonna maybe concentrate our efforts a little bit more on this. But when we do an EBUS, we, we're gonna scan all these lymph nodes. So typically we don't do EUS that often unless there's a, so these two lymph node stations, eight and nine that are lower, and they're rarely involved, but when they are, then we add EUS to our procedure. But basically what we do is we scan every single lymph node station that we have access to. If you have a right-sided lung mass, we're gonna start scanning the left side, so the N3 lymph nodes. And I look at every single lymph node station. If I see any lymph node that's abnormal, usually we say more than one centimeters, and then there's also uh, characteristics of the lymph node itself that suggest more malignant or more benign disease, but anything that's abnormal, I'm just gonna biopsy. And then I go from lymph node station to lymph node station to biopsy pretty much everything that looks abnormal so that I can give a full, uh, you know, staging procedure when I'm doing this for staging of lung cancer. Okay, thank you. And in your practice, do you uh, have uh, any discrepancy between PET CT scan and uh, results of biopsy? Um, I mean, in Iran, we have uh, many PET CT scan that uh, in um, mediastinal node or hilar node is positive, but after biopsy or after uh, lobectomy, the nodes um, are negative. Uh, do you have uh, this problem? Oh yes, it happens all the time. So if you look at the literature, you can, you can either upstage or downstage a patient if you just base your staging on PET scan um, and about 10 to 20% of these patients. So one patient out of five, if I'm relying on the PET scan to stage them, I'm not staging them appropriately. And I think we're all guilty of doing this. I mean, you know, if, you, if it looks abnormal on the PET scan and it's lighting up, then it has to be cancer. The guy has a, has a lung mass. But it is very uh, obvious and it's, it's very well stated in every single one of these guidelines that I've looked at. It's a grade one recommendation that you just should not rely on the PET scan to grade your mediastinum you know, to stage your mediastinum. Because in these patients specifically, as we said, one positive lymph node can completely change the stage, can completely change your treatment. You know, as Dr. Basim said, when you're stage three, you're doing radiation therapy. When you're stage one, you're not doing anything. You're just removing it and just observing the patient. So one positive lymph node can change your management completely if you have a mediastinal lymph node. So I think we need to be more aggressive in, you know, uh, surgically staging or, well, you know, staging with EBUS of these mediastinal lymph nodes and not just relying on the PET CT. Thank you. Uh, and excuse me, I have another question from Dr. Youssef. Um, if uh, the tumor um, is very large, for example, 10 centimeters or more than uh, that, uh, I mean, it is a T4 uh, stage. Um, do you prefer a concurrent chemoradiotherapy or is it better you do um, first uh, chemotherapy after that uh, radiotherapy? Yeah. I mean, uh, for huge tumor, for example, uh, we have a bronchosoma in apex and it is very large. Uh, is it possible um, doing concurrent chemoradiotherapy or it is better doing sequential chemo and radiotherapy? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And actually, we face this clinical scenario every now and then in the clinic. So if we look at the previous publication or comparisons between induction chemotherapy followed by concurrent chemoradiation versus upfront concurrent chemoradiation. There was really no benefit 
uh, by starting with induction chemotherapy in terms of oncologic outcomes. Now, on the other hand, us as a radiation oncologist, it's really better for us if the tumor can shrink because then our radiation fields could be smaller and probably the radiation toxicity could be less. But unfortunately, we, we cannot really tell that if we give the patient the induction chemotherapy that he's going to respond or the response rate is going to be guaranteed. And with the use of contemporary techniques, really, I, I haven't had really the case where the size of the tumor would prohibit the use of uh, radiation therapy, especially if we have the advanced techniques like IMRT. So my answer to you that I personally do not favor the use of induction chemotherapy, but is it a reasonable approach? It is, because the studies I alluded to did not lead to a worse oncologic outcomes. But on the other hand, uh, it, it doesn't give any benefit. Okay, thank you. And sorry, my last point is that nowadays, the concurrent chemotherapy regimen, you can really use the full dose chemotherapy, and maybe Dr. Farhat or our medical oncology colleagues can comment. In the past, they used to use uh, reduced doses of chemotherapy with our concurrent radiation. But nowadays, they can use really the full dose with the radiotherapy. So you will be addressing the microscopic systemic disease at the same time, uh, along with your synergistic effect of the chemotherapy to our radiation. I don't know if Dr. Samah, you have other uh, view on this. Well, yeah, I totally agree, Annie, with what you said. Uh, but there's an important scenario that also we need to discuss. Most of our, of our patients can present with metastatic disease stage four. So what's your approach for patients with oligometastasis? Like I say, locally advanced with a small adrenal metastatic disease. Would you go for uh, concurrent chemo radiation and then address that with uh, stereotactic radiation or do you give chemotherapy up front and then see how things turn uh, and then decide how to approach these patients? Yeah, so this is a completely different scenario. So in patients with oligometastasis, we already know that the cancer has went to distant sites, whether a single bone mat, whether a single adrenal metastasis. So it really makes more sense to start with systemic therapy because otherwise, if you start with local therapy, you, there is a high chance that the patient will pop a second or a third or a fourth metastasis. And hence, you would have uh, added local therapy that is futile and more costly and even uh, more toxic. So our strategy and all, most of the published literature on the topic, we now have two randomized studies addressing this issue. One is from MD Anderson, from Dr. Daniel Gomez, and one from uh, Texas as well, from Dr. Iyengar. So both of these investigators, when they treated oligometastatic non-small cell lung cancer, they started with systemic therapy, which could be either chemotherapy or immunotherapy or targeted therapy, depending on the pathologic uh, results. And then all the patients who have stable disease or partial response, then radiotherapy would be added as a consolidation to the primary yeah. and to the distant mat. So we have a question from uh, Isra Musa, Dr. Isra. Um, uh, what do you advise for patients with hypermetabolic mass of 3.5 centimeter encasing and narrowing the lift uh, mainstream bronchus with extension into the carina and adjacent soft tissue with no lymphadenopathy? So, uh, I'm not sure if uh, the message disappeared, but if in this case scenario, um, I think we're, we're discussing the staging or the treatment option. Uh, can we ask both doctors um, with a small lesion of 3.5 centimeter, very close to the carina, uh, would you think that biopsy would be, able, would, would be uh, a choice or should we just uh, stage the patient as the stage 3B or 3A and go ahead with the treatment. 
So from my standpoint, and as pulmonary, so this is simple to biopsy, well, fairly simple to biopsy with, if there's extension into the airway, it was just regular bronchoscopy. And if there's no, no invasion of the airway, you can, you can biopsy it with EBUS. This is very simple to biopsy with EBUS. Now, in, if you read the guidelines about staging in these cases, when you have uh, masses that invade the mediastinum or very, very close to the mediastinum, like this one would be, you know, the area around the trachea, that's lymph node station seven and four. You're talking about this is a, a, a mass that's in the mediastinum. Uh, in the ACCP guidelines, they say mediastinal masses that are like this are not resectable. So you're not going to be able to remove it. So you're just going to consider it an advanced stage three cancer and just go for systemic therapy, either, mm -hmm. you know, chemotherapy or if you can do radiation to some, to, to, to this kind of tumor, do radiation tumor. But this is not a resectable. You know, when we talk about stage three, the, the goal, if we can achieve it, is to resect it because that's curative intent. But if you cannot resect it like this, this specific mass, you have to make sure you, when you're doing APC, that means it's invading your airway. So you have to try to keep your airway open as much as possible. And then you're just going for systemic therapy. Okay, mm -hmm. Dr. Bassin, would you, do you have any comment? I yeah, have a comment. So if the tumor is invading the trachea, I agree with Dr. Danny that most uh, scenarios like this are tumors that are unresectable. Hence, the standard of care would be concurrent chemoradiotherapy. Now, if the tumor is invading the main bronchus, then some of these patients might be amenable for pneumonectomy and consultation with a cardiothoracic surgeon is definitely warranted. But most patients with tracheal involvement are unresectable and they're better treated with uh, concurrent chemoradiation. Yeah. Any comments? Uh -huh. Yes, I have. usually uh, for this case, I consult with thoracic surgeon. Uh, if um, they say that uh, the tumor may be, uh, may be resectable in after uh, induction chemotherapy, uh, we use, uh, prescribe no adjoint chemotherapy and uh, if the tumor um, response to chemotherapy and uh, um, small and uh, previous, uh, maybe it, it is re resectable. Um, but uh, if not, uh, not uh, resectable, uh, chemo radiotherapy is a preferred option for treatment. Okay. Um, we have a last question from the audience asking about. Uh, is brain MRI and PET CT scan indicated in all cases or in selected cases? I think. So the PET scan, as we said, so it's not, when they've looked at it as a staging study, it doesn't improve mortality. You could, you could uh, not use PET. I mean, if you look at the guidelines, they recommend using PET in these patients because it can be very helpful. And it's a, st it's a grade one recommendation. But if you had a CT with uh, contrast of the chest and abdomen, and then you did invasive staging of your mediastinum, uh, you know, sometimes that, that could be, yeah, nobody can fault you for this because it's not fully proven as a staging tool, but it's recommended to be done. In MRIs, uh, as, as we said, different uh, guidelines say different things about MRIs. Some guidelines say in stage three, stage four, and in symptomatic patients. Some guidelines say in all patients except grade one A. And some guidelines say uh, uh, if, if somebody is being evaluated for uh, resection therapy, like, you know, resection of lung cancer, then you do a brain MRI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now the uh, uh, guidelines has issued the recent uh, well, a guideline that helps us use MRI for staging, and they recommend to do it for all patients with stage two and above, stage two, stage three, stage four. It is an optional uh, choice for patients with stage 1B. So 1B optional, two and above, we have to do it because the risk of brain metastasis becomes higher. And yeah. for stage 1A, 
uh, we don't do it. And of course, if a patient comes with symptoms, with uh, neurological symptoms, we definitely have to do it. Because we have seen these patients, even with stage one, who present with a brain mat. Uh, this is what we've been doing. Okay. Um, there's Thank another you. question. Um, let's no, ask uh, the last question, Dr. Doctor, Sam, if you have well, yeah, no Dr. time. Sam, yeah, yeah, just if it is in one minute, because uh, yeah. we passed the time. Just if it is okay. in one minute. A very quick question. A patient with T2 right apical lesion, M3, received chemo radiation three years ago, now relapsed locally in the right apex. Only, uh, what are the three uh, treatment strategies? Dr. Bassam, do you have any comment? So T2 and three. Treated three years ago with the now, chemo radiation, and now we have a local recurrence. Only local, without Only lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes are negative. Yes. Uh, this is, uh, the, these are really tricky uh, scenarios. The, uh, honestly, the only hope for these patients is if the recurrence is potentially resectable. And in the apex, we know that there is the brachial plexus in that area. So reviewing the images with a cardiothoracic surgeon is a must. If the tumor involves the chest wall and is far away from the brachial plexus and from the vessels at that area, and it's potentially resectable, this is the only hope for the patient. You're telling me that he is node negative, so of course the lymph nodes have to be staged with, a, uh, with, a, with an EBUS, and if it's only a local recurrence that is resectable, this is the only chance for the patient. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you, thank you for the panelists and for the speakers, and also I would like to thank AstraZeneca and New Bridge. Uh, Dr. Zena, the floor is yours to present our uh, next speakers. Uh, it will be a symposium uh, to AstraZeneca uh, on intensity presented by Dr. Hampi Kourilly. He is a nematooncologist at Hotel Dieu de France uh, Hospital in Beirut. He will talk about a new era in the treatment of unresectable stage 3 non-small cell lung carcinoma. Dr. Kourilly, the floor is yours. Dr. Kudiyi, are you here? Thank you, Dr. Aoun, uh, for uh, this introduction. So my talk will be about Infinzi, a new era in the treatment of unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer. The indication and usage of this new drug in non-small cell lung cancer. Infinzi, in fact, is indicated for the treatment of patients with, with unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer whose disease has not progressed following concurrent platinum-based chemotherapy and radiation therapy. The objectives of my presentation will be uh, an overview on the current treatment landscape in stage three non-small cell lung cancer. Then I will highlight the rationale for the use of Infinzi following chemoradiation therapy, provide a detailed overview of the Pacific clinical trial, the efficacy and tolerability data utilizing Infinzi. And finally, I will discuss some patient cases that highlight eligible patient for Infinzi. So the current treatment landscape in stage three non-small cell lung cancer, approximately one third of patients with non-small cell lung cancer present with stage three disease, and the majority have unresectable tumors. So the discussion and the decision of treating this heterogeneous disease going from stage three A to stage three C is based on a multidisciplinary team with the pneumologist, the radiation therapist, the oncologist, and the radiologist to decide how to manage these uh, tumors based on the tumor size and the localization of the lymph nodes positivity. 
So you can see clearly that the decision, the therapeutic decision will depend from two important parameters. First, the tumor burden of the disease, because the stage three is not similar disease, it's an heterogeneous disease, and also the performance status of the patients. It can go from a palliative treatment to a surgery if we have a knockout and two. So based on the ESMO guidelines, we have this algorithm of treatment recommendation from patients with local regional non-small cell lung cancer. You can see clearly that after the CT imaging, we will suspect the staging of the disease and we need a confirmation using invasive lymph node modalities as mentioned by Dr. Gaspar and the decision will be taken according to the results obtained. If we have uh, non enlarged lymph node and peripheral tumor, probably not required if negative lymph node of PET, so we will do a surgery. When we have no enlarged and two nodes, but central tumor or healer lymph node or enlarged discrete and two lymph nodes, then we should see if it's N0, N1, we'll go to surgery. If it's N3, to go to non-surgical multimodality treatment. And if it's N2, we should discuss in a dedicated multidisciplinary assessment if it's if a surgically multimodality treatment can be done or non-surgical multimodality treatment should be done. And if we have an extensive mediastinal N2 infiltration, then it's an unresectable N2 and non-surgical multimodality treatment should be done. How to associate chemotherapy and radiation therapy? We have the sequential chemoradiation. We do our chemotherapy, then we do a closing radiation therapy. An exclusive concomitant chemoradiation is to combine at the same time the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy. What about the induction chemotherapy? So we start with chemotherapy to downstage the tumor, then we do a chemoradiation therapy. The consolidation chemotherapy is to start with chemorad concomitant chemoradiation with three cycles, for example, of chemotherapy after the end of the chemoradiation therapy. So in stage three non-small cell lung cancer, our aim is the cure. So practically nowadays, we are doing a chemoradiation therapy followed by active surveillance. This was the standard of care for more than 10 years. According to the ESMO guidelines, the new guidelines, we have an amendment saying that we have a new practice changing treatment that will be added to this standard of care. And this will be our discussion in the next 15 minutes. So we had an unmet need. Up to 89% of unresectant patients will eventually progress to metastatic non-small cell cancer, lung cancer. The five-year survival rate for patients with unresectable stage three non-small cell cancer is about only 15%. So First, we had the concurrent chemoradiotherapy as discussed by my colleague. We had an advantage compared to the sequential chemoradiation therapy. And this is very important in overall survival. We had an advantage of around 4.5% at five year survival. And also we had an advantage from the concurrent chemoradiation therapy compared to the sequential around 3% at two years and 2% at five years. What about the consolidation chemotherapy? So clearly we don't have an advantage of overall survival by adding a consolidation chemotherapy to the concomitant chemoradiation. And also we don't have an advantage in progression-free survival by adding uh, a consolidation chemotherapy to the standard chemoradiation therapy. So in clinical practice, 
Concurrent chemoradiation therapy is the standard treatment for patients with unresectable stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer. But we should know that only fit patients with PS0 or 1 and age less than 70 to 75, patients who didn't lose weight more than 5%, patients who don't have comorbidities, cardiac or pulmonary comorbidities will benefit from this treatment. Platinum-based chemotherapy at cytotoxic dose, three to four cycles, or carboplatin paclitaxel weekly. No consolidation, no maintenance chemotherapy. Induction chemotherapy, one to two cycle if delay needed to begin radiation therapy or to reduce tumor volume. Only 40% of patients with unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer are eligible for concurrent chemoradiation therapy. This was the data that we have till 2019. And you can see clearly until the Pacific trial during the last 10 years before this date, we didn't have any advancement in the management of stage three unresectable non-small cell lung cancer. Many consolidation treatment were evaluated, going from gefitinib to cetuximab, but all the results were negative. So till the first results of Pacific study who changed the standard of care. What is the rationale of this immunotherapy after chemoradiation therapy? As you can see clearly, that radiation-induced tumor cell death, releasing a diverse array of tumor antigens. As a result, the PDL1 is upregulated, and consequently, a PDL1 blockage, blockage will be more efficient. So, radiation primes the immune system. Infinzy enables the immune response. You know better than me this mechanism of action of immune checkpoint inhibitors in when we are inhibiting the inhibition of the immune system and you are leading to the activation of, of this immune system using the PD-1 and the PD-L1 blockage. So why immunotherapy could be an interesting option in stage three non-small cell lung cancer? Because first, approximately one third of patients with non-small cell lung cancer present with stage three disease. The majority of patients have unrejectable symptoms. Second, the majority of unrejected patients. The majority of unresected patients will eventually progress to metastatic disease. So we have an unmet need and only chemoradiation therapy will not be able to cure the patient. Third, we know that the radiation will induce the secretion of antigens and consequently will activate, will have more importance of this anti-PDL1 blockade. So in Finzi de Durvalumab, the first and only approved immunotherapy to improve overall survival and PFS in stage three non-small cell lung cancer following chemoradiation therapy in unresectable patients. The design of the Pacific Pivotal Phase three study of Infinzi in unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer, it's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled international study. So the patients were eligible if were unresectable and locally advanced stage three. The patients had the platinum-based chemoradiation therapy more or equal to two cycle of chemotherapy overlapping with radiation therapy. The patient were evaluated and we were sure that they didn't have any progressing disease. And the time before randomization and the end of the chemoradiation therapy was between one and 42 days. And we have two to one randomization in Finzi 
10 milligram per kilogram in every two weeks up to 12 months versus placebo. The primary endpoint, we had actually two co-primary endpoints, the overall survival and the progression-free survival. Some details about the patients in this study. So the chemotherapy included cisplatin or carboplatin, or both if we had to stop the cisplatin for a reason or another, plus one of the following etoposide, vinorelbin, paclitaxel, vamblastin, docetaxel, or premetrexel. 92% of patients had received a total dose of radiation. Selected patients, characteristic at study start, median age 64, 70% male, 53% stage 3, and 46% squamous. Patients were enrolled regardless of PDL1 expression or EGFR and ALK status. You can see clearly that the two arms of the study were really well balanced, going from the sex, the age randomization, the smoking status, and also the disease characteristic, the disease staging, the tumor histology, the PDL1 expression status, and WHO performance. So, as we can see, one of the primary endpoints, the overall survival. We had 32% reduction in the risk of death with infinity versus placebo. And we have a hazard ratio of 0.68. The median overall survival was not reached versus 28.7 months for the control arm. And this result was confirmed with the follow-up of three years. Also, we have a similar hazard ratio. You can see the plateau at the end of the curve of uh, the dur valumab compared to the placebo arm. Also, an unprecedented 11.2 months median progression-free survival improvement with Infinzi. This is the second primary endpoint, and we have 16.8 months versus 5.6 months to the placebo arm, and this is really a uh, non precedent result and a spectacular result going from the PFS on the, and the OS for an unmet need in this indication. If we want to see the pre specified subgroup analysis, we have an advantage in overall survival in all the groups in favor of Infinzi. Also concerning the PFS, we have an advantage, but you can see probably the EGFR mutation because we have a really small population. It's not clearly significant, but in the all other groups, we have an advantage of infancy. What about the quality of life? One of the goals of, uh, to, for our patients in oncology, when we add the infancy compared to placebo, we have a similar, no significant change for baseline with quality of life in the infancy and in the placebo group. So the treatment, as you can see in the Pacific Regimen, chemoradiation therapy, platinum-based, followed by infancy. What a, an important remark concerning the starting of infancy after the chemoradiation therapy. You can see if we start earlier, before 14 days at the end of the chemoradiation therapy, we have better results. So patients who initiated infancy within 14 days following chemoradiation therapy had a 58% reduction in the risk of death versus placebo. And this is really important. So when we finish our chemoradiation therapy, we should do the evaluation. We should be sure that the patient did not progress and we should start the infancy in the next two weeks after the end of chemoradiation therapy. What about the side effect and the toxicity? Infancy was generally well tolerated. The most common adverse reaction, more than 20% were cough, fatigue, dyspnea, and radiation pneumonitis. And you can see that the grade three or four pneumonitis or radiation pneumonitis 
occurred in 3.4% in Infinzi and 2.1% on the placebo group. And it's really comparable. And also the fatal pneumonitis and fatal pneumonia was similar and comparable between the placebo group and the Infinzi group. What about the immune mediated adverse reaction? Also were similar between the two arms. We have 3.4% grade three immune related adverse reaction versus 2.6 in the placebo arm. And the discontinuation rate due to adverse event was practically similar 15.4 versus 9.8. So what about the posology and method of administration? The Infinzi is administered 10 milligram per kilo in one hour IV infusion once every two weeks and the treatment duration is up to one year. So 12 months. So what about the recommended immune adverse reaction management for Infinzi? As in other immune checkpoint inhibitors, we should be dealing with the management of the toxicities and mainly the immune related. They are not frequent, but when they are present, we should know how to deal with it. So we should withhold Infinzi for any of the following immune mediated pneumonitis, for example, grade two immune mediated hepatitis, colitis, nephritis. Also, we should withhold Infinzi until clinically stable patients for any of the following hyperthyroidism, grade two to four, immune mediated adrenal insufficiency or infection. And we should not change the treatment to Infinzi with hypothyroidism or type one diabetes mellitus. Uh, we should stop or discontinue Infinzi mainly when we have grade three to four toxicities, going to pneumonitis, hepatitis, colitis. When we have three to four, we should think seriously to discontinue the Infinzi treatment. So some case of patients eligible for Infinzi, let's meet Joseph, a patient with unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer, age 69 years old, ECOG performance status of one, medical history COPD treated with LABA, smoking history one pack per day for 50, 55 years, and he stopped smoking too late after non-small cell lung cancer diagnosis. So without support from a cave caregiver, Joseph relies solely on his doctor to educate him on treatment options and recommend the most appropriate option. As you can see on the imaging, we have 7.5 centimeter mass in the left upper lobe with possible mediastinal involvement and encroaching on the trachea and carina one centimeter subcarinal mass. The histology was non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. The PFT fair and we brain MRI was negative, no metastatic lesions in the brain. So after a discussion in the multidisciplinary team, uh, upon a full review of Joseph case, the multidisciplinary team members determined his tumor to be unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer and decided to take a curative intent approach to treatment. They chose to initiate treatment with the Pacific regimen, chemoradiation therapy followed by Infinzi in case we don't have any progression. The follow-up of Joseph has been assessed following completion of chemoradiation therapy. So chemoradiation therapy response was stable disease, no new lesion, residual side effect, chemoradiation therapy well tolerated, ECOG was one, and we have CBC and LFT. So based on Joseph follow-up, when would you feel comfortable initiating Infinzi to align with objectives set in the MDT review? As I mentioned before, we should start the Infinzi. It will be better to start, according to the trial is one to 14 days, but we saw that before 14 days after the completion of chemoradiation therapy, it will be better to start the Infinzi and we will have better results and 58%
of uh, reduction of deaths, which is really important. What about Gabrielle? It's another patient with undetectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer, age 69, presentation, bladder pain from the full body CT. So we had a lung mass was discovered. The medical history, hypertension, previous myocardial infarction. He was a former heavy smoker, one pack per day for 30 years. What about the initial diagnosis? 4.2 centimeter mass in the left lower lobe with N3 nodal involvement. So the patient was considered unoperable. Squamous non-small cell lung cancer and the brain MRI was negative. So at initial multidisciplinary team review of Gabrielle case, the team decided to immediately initiate the Pacific Regimen. So Gabrielle successfully, successfully completed three cycles of chemo, two of which overlapped with radiation therapy and initiated in FIMSI 20 days later after confirming the absence of progression. In the follow-up, Gabrielle responded well to Infinzi for the first two months of treatment. However, he recently presented with symptoms of pneumonitis. Following examination by his pneumologist and medical oncologist, it was determined that he has a grade two pneumonitis. Thus, it was unclear whether the adverse reaction was caused by radiation or Infinzi. So how we manage the grade two pneumonitis, it's important to see that in the Pacific trial, the radiation pneumonitis is frequently observed in patients receiving radiation therapy to the lung. And the combined rate of radiation pneumonitis and pneumonitis, regardless of causality, was 33.9 with the infinite versus 25% in the placebo. And the grade three and four pneumonitis was 3.4% versus 2.6. It was really comparable between the two arms. So as you can see in this table, when we have the grade two immune mediated pneumonitis, we should withhold Infinzi and initiate one to two milligram per kilogram per day prednisone or equivalent followed by a taper to see if we can resume and reintroduce the Infinzi after the symptoms are uh, completely disappeared. But when we have grade three or four, probably we will permanently discontinue Infinzi. And when we have a grade one, we can continue easily the treatment with Infinzi. So as a summary, Infinzi is the first and only approved immunotherapy to improve the overall survival and PFS in stage three non-small cell lung cancer following chemo radiation in unresectable patient. It's important to see that we have a clear advantage in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.68. Consider Infinzi for all of your eligible patients with unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hampik. Uh, I hope we will have many, many questions and the panel discussion and we will move directly to the clinical case uh, presentation uh, who will discuss a multidisciplinary approach uh, by Dr. Mohsen Mokhtar, Professor of Clinical Oncology and founder and President of Can Survive Cairo University, Asseline Medical School, Cairo, Egypt. Dr. Uh, Mohsen Mokhtar, the floor is yours. Doctor, please, you need to unmute yourself. We are not hearing you. Okay. Again, thank you uh, for having me, and it's a pleasure to be amongst you. Um, this, uh, and I'll be asking the panelists a couple of questions. I think um, the patient is actually lucky that we have all these panelists with us. Uh, unfortunately, she's already started therapy. She's in the middle of her therapy, but let me see 
how uh, you would feel about what we've given her and uh, if we could have changed anything. These are my disclosures. This is Mrs. M. She presented to us actually uh, uh, in, in May 2020. She's a, got a very, very long history. She, in 2011, so that's nine years ago, she had a left a mastectomy for an ER positive tumor where she received chemotherapy as well as uh, um, uh, uh, radiotherapy, and this was followed by hormonal therapy. Then in 2017, she had a right lung mass that was 1.5 centimeters. It was biopsied and proved to be adenocarcinoma from uh, lung origin. That time she did the analysis or molecular analysis uh, for that mass. The mass was totally uh, was uh, uh, exon 19 deletion EGFR mutant, and she had radiofrequency ablation was done for that uh, mass, and then the patient was put on follow up. This was her follow up uh, in uh, uh, March of 2019, and you can see that there is necrotic fibrotic uh, uh, mass in the lung in the right lower uh, lobe. This is where it, it was. And you can see that the maximum SUV was uh, 2.8 uh, uh, as compared to 2.9 previously. And again, she was uh, put under follow-up and nothing was done for that. Then unfortunately in uh, March of 2020, she came up with a definite mass of two by two centimeter that had an SUV of 6.1 compared to 4.6 in the previous. And also she had a hyalur, right hyalur lymph node. So if you take up the staging as Danny was telling us, this is probably a stage two uh, patient. And stage two patients will probably go on for surgery. And that's actually what uh, she went on for and she was admitted to uh, the hospital. She went and had an exploratory uh, thoracotomy. The mass in the right lower lobe was uh, removed, but then there was this hard fixed interlobular node that was very difficult to remove. And accordingly, the surgeon did not remove it because there was an exposure to the pulmonary artery and the decision was turned into just a wedge resection was done, removing the, uh, the lung mass without removing that lymph node. She was well after that and she was discharged. So the first question would be to um, Danny and um, I thought we might have a surgeon. Uh, I know Danny, uh, uh, I don't know whether Danny is a surgeon or not, but uh, is a PET scan enough or should we have done more for this patient that is uh, actually a stage two? And how frequent is it to encounter uh, not complete uh, or you can't do a complete description for these patients with stage two? Can I get uh, Danny to answer? Yes, thank you, Dr. Mukhtar. Thank you. So um, the, the issue in this case is that uh, well, there's two things. It is recommended to do an invasive workup of the mediastinum for two reasons in this case. Well, the first one is that if the tumor is central, so let's say you had the tumor, even if you did not have the lymph node, that lymph node that's lighting up on PET, if the tumor is central, they found that the risk of having mediastinal lymph node involvement is at least intermediate. So if you have a central tumor, even if all the lymph nodes look normal, you should do staging of the mediastinum. And if you have any positive lymph node, even if these are N1 lymph node, the node that you showed is a hyalur lymph node, it's an N1 lymph node. But they also found, you know, the studies where you see something like this, you go and remove it, and then you find out they have mediastinal lymph node involvement. So they found that if you have an N1 lymph node that is either enlarged or PET positive, then you have N2, N2, then the risk of N2 or N3 disease is at least intermediate and you should also stage these patients. So yes, she needed to have, PET is not enough to stage somebody like her and, uh, and you should have a more invasive evaluation of the, uh, of the mediastinum. And the uh, second question, oh, sorry, is, is it frequent to encounter unresectable patients, so a stage two patient and this is, 
they opened her up and, and, and you can see that it was a proper stage two. But that, that, that high lymph node was uh, hard, fixed, and difficult to remove. Is that also frequent? So I'm a pulmonologist, I'm not a surgeon, oh, but okay. I've, yeah. done, I've done interventional training where we've done hundreds and hundreds of these cases. And this is very rare. I think I remember one case where they could not remove it, it was just closed or, I mean, sometimes they go in, it looks like a typical lymph node and it's invading the pulmonary artery or it's stuck against the aorta or something of that nature and yeah. they cannot remove it, but it's not common, no. That, to my knowledge, at least. Okay. So that's, that's not a comment. And uh, again, this is unfortunate for the patient. Anyway, the patient came back with uh, the pathology of uh, right lower lobe papillary adenocarcinoma. This time when we did her genetic testing, we found her to be EGFR, but not 19, exon 19 mut uh, mutant. It's an exon 21 mutant. And she is PDL1 uh, negative. So. The question to the panelists uh, in terms of radiation therapy as well as uh, um, Professor Khoury, uh, what would you do for this patient? Would you consider this patient as being a adjuvant or would you consider her as a stage three under second? Yeah, good, uh, good, uh, good evening, uh, Mohsen. It's a very interesting case. Hi. How are you? Uh, great. Uh, so uh, I rarely see in patients like uh, like Danny was saying, uh, going to the OR and then coming up without uh, a complete resection. Uh, mm -hmm. But it happened. Well, all of us had some cases like this. So definitely, we would uh, decide that this patient is stage three unresected unresectable. He has uh, a tumor into his uh, lung now uh, in the mediastinum and he, he needs uh, a definitive treatment for uh, to get a chance of cure. Remember that the, the lymph node is two by two. That's the only thing that's showing up. It's just the two by two. That's yeah, but if, if I understood but, well but, that, yeah, it, that he has still... It's unresected, so he still has a tumor in the media, in the exactly. lungs. Or the so I, I think I think that's the important message that there is still a tumor there, even though that this is a two by two uh, centimeter lymph node that is uh, still there. Remember that this patient is PDL1 negative and EGFR uh, positive. So my next question would be, what would you do? Chemo radio, radio alone? Would you give her for? Uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, immuno, so the, the following the Pacific, or would you go for targeted therapy being an EGFR mutant, or would you just go for targeted therapy alone? Now, before I get you to answer all that, I'm just going to give you a bit of uh, data that uh, just to wrap up uh, all of this. So we remember that the combined uh, analysis that obviously concurrent is better than uh, sequential uh, radiotherapy or than radiotherapy alone. So obviously she's supposed to receive some sort of concurrent chemo radio. Remember also that all the therapies, targeted therapies, whether they were anti-EGFRs or the addition of something like BEV or even Olotinib did not show any benefit in terms of uh, a consolidation therapy following um, uh, induction chemo radiotherapy. But remember also that these patients were not picked by molecular testing. So we don't have the data on whether they, they could improve in patients with an EGFR mutant. So we've got a lot of failed strategies, increasing the dose of radiotherapy. We just heard that stereotactic radiotherapy, again, is not uh, uh, of much benefit for these patients for, from our radiotherapist, uh, Dr. Richen. And we've also seen that the consolidation uh, uh, chemotherapy is, uh, is not uh, of benefit for these patients. Then we had the Pacific that was uh, clearly um, uh, described by uh, Professor Khoury with an overall survival benefit for these patients, hazard ratio of 0.68. But remember that that overall survival was not seen in patients that are PDL1 negative. You do get a progression free survival, even though it's modest, but this patient is a PDL1 negative. So, are you going to give her Infinzi for one year when you don't have an overall survival benefit? The second is a, a trial that was also uh, sort of the same that was presented in the expose, the Keynote 799. Again, this was the use of uh, pembrolizumab 
with pemetrexate uh, or cisplatin or carboplatin taxel. Uh, this was not sort of a randomization, but what you can see is that you're generally getting the same results as probably those from, uh, uh, from the Impinzi. You, you are getting an overall response rate for these patients that is actually quite high. You can see that there is uh, around a 75% response with a long duration of response. Now, one of the therapies that could be given to this patient, if you consider her as a uh, a metastatic case, uh, a patient or completely resected patient, these, this fits for our patients. Uh, this was a stage 3A patient, the ADORA trial that came also out in the ASCO. This was the uh, use of ozimertinib for patients who were completely resected. So it doesn't really fit our patient, but maybe after radiotherapy we could use that. Ozimertinib was given for these patients, and you can see that the disease-free survivor in that patient who is a stage two, uh, as you can consider her here, or a stage three A, is actually a hazard ratio of 0.17 and 0.12. So really remarkable for the use of ozimertinib in these EGFR mutant uh, patients, whether stage two or stage three. But remember, in this trial, they were all completely resected. I think the one that is going to be most fitting for this patient is what's known as the LORA trial. The LORA trial is stage 3A, 3B, 3C tri uh, patients who are going to receive concurrent chemoradiotherapy or sequential chemoradiotherapy. Being EGFR mutant, they are going to receive uh, ozimertinib uh, for, for, for that, um, following uh, the concurrent chemoradiotherapy. And I think when the data from this trial comes out, I think this is going to be the most fitting for our patient. But unfortunately, we do not have that data for, uh, for this right now. So who wants to give me what they would do for uh, this patient? Uh, Dr. Khoury, what, what would you do? So concerning the, for sure we should, if we consider that is a stage three unresectable, have only, the Pacific trial that fit with our patient, the LORA and the FLORA trial, is not acceptable because it's not directly after the advent of ozimertinib. So it's not possible. LORA trial, clear data on it. So it yeah, we don't have the data. More, yeah. Most, but unfortunately, we don't still have data. Concerning the PDL1, you mentioned that probably in the Pacific trial, the subgroup did not benefit as the other groups. However, uh, the label and the FDA approval of this drug is completely independent of the PDL1. So, and also independently of the EGFR and the ALK scale. Also, because as we know, recently we will be able to do the testing for the three because we have a new drug that will be implemented in the clinical practice but before it was not indicated clearly in this setting because we don't have any treatment so i think that chemo radiation followed by durvalumab will be the best option on the results and the study that we have for the moment uh, Dr. The Buddy, what do you think? specialist of lung cancer is also uh, in line with uh, me or has another opinion. Dr. I, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kuri. Uh, you're always the scientific uh, one between our multidisciplinary group. So I agree with you. You've uh, said it clearly. So uh, for this patient, concurrent chemo radiation, yes. Ozimertinib adjuvant, no, until now. Uh, as for uh, Durvalumab, I would favor it, but I will discuss it with the patient. I will discuss the benefit risk in this subgroup of patient population. But, yeah, because the subgroup, I, I'm, I, I'm sure that the PDL1 negative do have a benefit in PFS, but not in OS. And the other thing is that they are, she is EGFR uh, mutant, which also you, Professor Khoury, said that they don't really benefit but it was a small subgroup of, 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 uh, of patients. Uh, what, about, uh, what about radiation? Uh, uh, what radiation would you give? And I, I'll take that to Professor uh, Bessem. Um, what radiation uh, would, would you give for this, for this patient? 
Yeah, so going back to the, to the initial presentation of the patient where she was found to have this primary lung mass with, with bulky and one disease, this is what I understand this case is. No, so she's, it's, she's, she's not bulky, it's, it's a two centimeter. So unresectable or you just discovered during surgery that was unresectable? During surgery it was discovered to be unresectable. Yes, so typically at our institution we present all these cases in a tumor board where a thoracic surgeon is present and we, we sometimes face this case where we have lymph nodes that uh, make the surgery difficult. So in some of these cases we consider the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy to try to shrink these lymph nodes and make them amenable for a complete lobectomy plus lymph node dissection. And here the input of a thoracic surgeon is uh, very important. Now, if upfront we know that these lymph nodes are unresectable, then we just proceed with concurrent chemoradiation. Or in a case like the one you presented, where it was only discovered after surgery that these lymph nodes cannot be resected, the standard of care is to treat them as stage three concurrent chemoradiotherapy. Uh, to be followed by uh, but, considering. My, my question is, what 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 was the what would be the plan of radiotherapy? What what would you give radiotherapy? Just that high lymph node, or would you take the full mediastinal lymph nodes with them? So we have now randomized studies that compared involved field radiotherapy versus elective nodal irradiation, and these studies have clearly shown that if you treat only the involved lymph nodes the risk of having recurrences in the elective areas is less than three to 5%. So our standard of care is to treat only the gross disease, those of 60 to 66 gray and two gray perfection. So you give just a lymph node, a two centimeter lymph node uh, radiotherapy? Yeah, so we take data from the PET scan and from the eBus to target the positive lymph nodes. All right. I'll tell uh, you what we, we did. Uh, uh, yeah, Fadi, you want to say something? Uh, no, uh, I saw that Dr. Dahdah, who is a thoracic surgeon, raised his hand. So I'm oh, yeah, sure he has a command. Dr. Dahdah, you're with us. Yeah, it was two minutes ago. So <laughs> maybe he's not. Adi, we have to give him permission to, to enter. Oh, okay. From Science Pro, please uh, give him permission to, to talk. Kara, can you give uh, Dr. Dahdah the mic? Hello. Let me tell you what we did till, till Dr. Dahdah comes in. We actually started... Uh, sorry? I'm with you. Yeah, I'm here. We, we I'm started here. concurrent chemo. Yeah, yeah Dr. Dahdah, please. Yeah, I, I, hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, this amazing meeting. Uh, two questions about uh, uh, about this patient. Uh, uh, well, in 2017, she underwent an SBRT for the 1.5 lesion uh, adenocarcinoma in her uh, right lower lobe. So why was that, and why was not a full uh, lobectomy at that time? Second question. Uh, uh, she well, went. She went for radiofrequency ablation. Okay, uh, and and you judge three years later that this patient will un will will go uh, uh, for a lobectomy uh, uh, for her uh, two centimeter uh, uh, N1 disease. She underwent a, a wedge resection. She underwent a wedge resection and. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. I got that point. Uh, so two two issues for the for the uh, well we we see sometimes that the, that uh, we go inside the oper operative theater and then we find out that. Uh, tumor is not resectable, but uh, those cases are, are really kept for a T4 where while we have a mediastinal invasion, uh, really a big mediastinal invasion, and we're surprised that uh, this tumor is not uh, resectable. So, uh, well, everybody has uh, such a case, but uh, for uh, N1 disease, and we found out that it is not a, a, a uh, I, 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 I totally believe you, but the problem was that she, she had one of the best surgeons uh, or, or yeah yeah, yeah. I, I don't doubt that i don't doubt that so well, so so that's why i wouldn't send her again for resurgery i think one yeah. of the options that you could discuss or i could ask you would you amend giving chemotherapy uh, for two cycles and then going 
in and resecting this. Exactly, I, I agree with Dr. Bassem. So uh, two options, it's either you go for a new adjuvant and then uh, you do a, a, a redo uh, or you complete your lobectomy. Uh, uh, this is uh, one option. Uh, if you find out that uh, uh, the new adjuvant didn't give us that much, why not going for a full uh, pneumonectomy is if the patient is is the, is the is the is if it is manageable for the patient. So uh, new adjuvant, I think, as Dr. Bassem was saying, and uh, then uh, uh, redo imaging. Uh, if we are still at the same or the the the, the lymph node shrinked, then we go for a lobectomy. If not, why not uh, to prepare the patient and go for a, for a pneumonectomy? I, ha I have just one, one thing that, that, uh, that uh, my answer was relying on one thing, is that this patient survived a, a lung cancer uh, uh, treated with a radio frequency for three years. Then, uh, and she, she relapsed with a small and, two, uh, and one with a two centimeter in the same. So I would give her the, the full chances uh, for a curative treatment before thinking of uh, uh, definite chemo or uh, immunotherapy. Then. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we should go, go on with the case because of the time. Uh, I'll no, tell you what we, I tell you what we did. What we did was uh, I, I, I totally believe that uh, what, what you said. I was, I was prepared to give this patient actually uh, an anti-EGFR and send her back for, uh, for surgery. The patient, uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, according to Dr. Fuli, went uh, or started chemo radiotherapy. But the, the physician treating her right now is going to give her ozimertinib uh, at the end of, uh, of the chemo radiotherapy, not, uh, uh, not infant. That's very innovative, I would say. Uh, why not? Maybe yeah, it's a exactly. chance for the patient. It's according. It's, it's according. It's according to the. To, as I said, we've got this trial, the Laura trial, that it is going. We don't have results. I'm not the treating physician for this. So don't don't look at me and blame me for. for what uh, no, no, Mohsen, that's very innovative. Why not? Uh, maybe this why not? I I, I, told, I, 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 I thought I'd give her ozimertinib and then go in for a resection. That's what that I would I would think. Anyway, thank you very much and thank you for sharing your thoughts and I hope that you enjoyed the, the case. Thank you, Mohsen. Always uh, lovely to see you. Really. Thank you, Mohsen. The case is uh, very interesting, really is very interesting. Uh, now uh, I will introduce uh, our new panelist uh, just to take uh, questions because we have a lot. And we'll try to analyze within uh, 10 minutes all uh, our session. So, Al Naqash uh, from Iraq and Dr. Fadi Karak from Lebanon. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you. The, the talk, uh, Hampik, you covered a lot of things. We appreciate so much what you did. And uh, the case was so challenging. Thank you so much, Mohsen. Uh, if I might ask a question for both of you, how uh, do you see the major challenge in the management of stage three non-small cell lung cancer? Is it the coordination between uh, multi-specialities or uh, the availability of a drug or the different options for treatment? How do you see it, uh, Dr. Kourie and, uh, and Dr. Mohsen? Uh, so I think it's really important to have the MDTs. It's really crucial in the stage three because we need the surgeon, we need the radiation therapist, we need the radiologist, the oncologist to decide all together what to do because no one knows everything. And during this educational session, it was great to listen to Dr. Gaspar, to Dr. Yusuf, to share their point of view about the same disease that we are dealing with as oncologists, uh, they are as uh, pneumologists and as radiotherapists. So it's really important to discuss all together. And this is a difficulty in the centers when, where there is not uh, MDTs. And that's why the management of stage three needs specialized center with big load of patients to optimize the care 
of our patient and to offer them the best treatment. And also, as you know, that the map is not really approved from all the uh, third payer parties. Now we have patients that insurances are approving it, but ho hopefully that very soon it will be also approved in the uh, from other uh, third party payers and the type of radiation therapies i don't know if dr Yusuf can help us if the imrt is approved by different parties or they are doing other kind of treatments when needed actually it's a great question dr antig so as i showed in my presentation IMRT has shown to be uh, superior in the treatment of locally advanced stage three lung cancer. And it's mainly by decreasing the toxicity, specifically radiation pneumonitis and esophagitis. But unfortunately in this country, we have only few uh, insurance companies that are covering it, but the other third party payers are not doing that. And it's a costly treatment for self payers. So we, ha we are dealing with this problem every day in our clinic and we are being flexible uh, depending on the coverage of the patient. Those who can afford it, it is clearly better. And those who are self-payer, we are just uh, offering both options because they are similar in terms of uh, local control. It's mainly the toxicity profile that's improved with IMRT. Uh, sorry, I'd like to say hi to everybody. Uh, Dr. Youssef, um, Dr. Unawar from Iraq. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, uh, have you any experience in ARC and VMAT uh, techniques? And is there any superiority in lung cancer treatment regarding the, re uh, the, the isodose curves and the uh, better saving of normal tissue? Uh, or just it is a matter of time per the session? Because uh, we have the technique of IMRT, but it, you know the, the treatment session will be long. Uh, uh, do you have an experience in ARC or VMAT? Uh, are the drafts of them are better? Your opinion about that? Yeah, so thank you for your question. Uh, the two techniques are actually very similar. Um, if you have a good physicist, a good dosimetrist who is willing to spend the time to achieve a good IMRT plan, eventually the, uh, the DVH or the normal tissue exposure to radiotherapy is, can become really similar between the two, especially when we're talking about non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, the main difference is actually the treatment time. So per session, VMAT definitely wins in terms of the duration of the radiotherapy session. Uh, you will need uh, less time to have uh, the, the session finished. Now in other sites, it has shown to be superior like in head and neck cancer, there are many publications that show that it can give you uh, a better plan in terms of conformality and sparing of the normal tissues. But in the chest, specifically non-small cell lung cancer, you can achieve excellent plans with the two techniques. The condition is that you have a good dosimetrist, a good physicist who's willing to spend the time uh, to give you a good IMRT plan. Uh, sorry about uh, the... The, the central tumors, you know, the respiratory movements are less, but what about peripheral tumors? If you want to include the primary tumor is in the periphery, uh, would be more difficult. What about respiratory gating? Yeah, so actually what we've been doing for our patients is the use of, of a 4D CT scan. And with this technology, we are able to map the location of the tumor throughout the breathing cycle. And eventually we treat a target that is bigger than the actual size of the tumor. But by using this technique, you ensure coverage of the tumor in all of its location during the breathing cycle. And this is a technology that we use in our center. It's not available throughout the country. In the peripheral centers, it's not available. Um, um, I treat patients in two different hospitals. And at AUB, we have it we offer it to our patients. And the other hospital in the periphery, it's not available. So we'll just have to, de to do, use the normal CT simulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to add on to, to what uh, um, uh, Fadi was asking. What are the challenges? I think the main challenge is planning this patient from the beginning for uh, chemo 
physical therapy with a consolidation of infinity. I think that's the most important that uh, you, you evaluate your patient from the beginning and you evaluate him in the uh, middle and right at the end because a lot of physicians who are still thinking of uh, chemo radiotherapy will uh, evaluate their patients later on, later than that 14 days. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges. You are missing out when you don't start the Infinzi within the 14 days. So I think that's, that's one of the challenges that we have that not all physicians will uh, evaluate the patients uh, immediately at the end of uh, radiotherapy. Uh, Dr. Fadi, do we have any questions from the participants to answer? Dr. Fadi, do you hear me? Uh, I don't Fadi. see any questions. I don't see any questions right now, Dr. Sam. So, so okay, if you allow me, uh, uh, it seems that uh, Dr. Farahat has some problems with the internet. So if you allow me, uh, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, Dr. Zena, thank you to be sharing the session. Thank you for all the speakers and panelists and all participants and also for Newbridge and AstraZeneca and we'll see you inshallah next Tuesday uh, July 7th we'll talk about session one of GU malignancy thank you all thank you thank you thank you pleasure thank you very much thank you hope to see you soon thank you